Lot number 249. Of the dealings of Edward Bellingham, with William Monkhouse Lee, and of the cause of the great terror of Abercrombie Smith, it may be that no absolute and final judgment will ever be delivered. It is true that we have the full and clear narrative of Smith himself, and such corroboration as he could look for from Thomas Stiles, the servant, from the Reverend Plumptree Peterson, fellow of Olds, and from such other people as chanced to gain some passing glance at this or that incident in a singular chain of events. Yet, in the main, the story must rest upon Smith alone, and the most will think that it is more likely that one brain, however outwardly sane, has some subtle warp in its texture, some strange flaw in its workings, than that the path of nature has been overstepped in open day, in so famed a centre of learning and light as the University of Oxford. Yet when we think how narrow and how devious this path of nature is, how dimly we can trace it, for all our lamps of science, and how, from the darkness which girds it round, great and terrible possibilities loom ever shadowly upwards, it is a bold and confident man who will put a limit to the strange bypaths into which the human spirit may wander. In a certain wing of what we will call Old College, in Oxford, there is a corner turret of an exceeding great age. The heavy arch which spans the open door has bent downwards in the centre under the weight of its years and the grey, lichen-blotched blocks of stone are bound and knitted together with withies and strands of ivy, as though the old mother had set herself to brace them up against wind and weather. From the door a stone stair curves upward spirally, passing two landings and terminating in a third one, its steps all shapeless and hollowed by the tread of so many generations of the seekers after knowledge. Life has flowed like water down this winding stair, and, water-like, has left these smooth-worn grooves behind it. From the long-gowned pedantic scholars of Plantagenet days, down to the young bloods of a later age, how full and strong has been that tide of young, English life! And what was left now of all those hopes, those strivings, those fiery energies, save here and there in some old-world churchyard a few scratches upon a stone, and perchance a handful of dust in a mouldering coffin. Yet here were the silent stair and the grey old wall, with bend and saltire, and many another heraldic device still to be read upon its surface, like grotesque shadows thrown back from the days that had passed. In the month of May, in the year 1884, three young men occupied the sets of rooms which opened onto the separate landings of the old stair. Each set consisted simply of a sitting room and of a bedroom, while the two corresponding rooms upon the ground floor were used, the one as a coal cellar and the other as the living room of the servant or scout, Thomas Stiles, whose duty it was to wait upon the three men above him. To right and to left was a line of lecture rooms and of offices, so that the dwellers in the old turret enjoyed a certain seclusion, which made the chambers popular among the more studious undergraduates. Such were the three who occupied them now, Abercrombie Smith above, Edward Bellingham beneath him, and William Monkhouse Lee upon the lowest story. It was ten o'clock on a bright spring night, and Abercrombie Smith lay back in his armchair, his feet upon the fender, and his briar-root pipe between his lips. In a similar chair, and equally at his ease, there lounged on the other side of the fireplace his old school friend, Jeffro Hasty. Both men were in flannels, for they had spent their evening upon the river, but apart from their dress, no one could look at their hard-cut, alert faces without seeing that they were open-air men, 
men whose minds and tastes turned naturally to all that was manly and robust. Hasty, indeed, was stroke of his college boat, and Smith was an even better oar. But a coming examination had already cast its shadow over him and held him to his work, save for a few hours a week which health demanded. A litter of medical books upon the table, with scattered bones, models, and anatomical plates, pointed to the extent as well as the nature of his studies, while a couple of single sticks and a set of boxing gloves above the mantelpiece hinted at the means by which, with Hasty's help, he might take his exercise in its most compressed and least distant form. They knew each other very well, so well that they could sit now in that soothing silence which is the very highest development of companionship. Have some whisky, said Abercrombie Smith at last, between two cloudbursts. Scotch in the jug and Irish in the bottle. No thanks, I'm in for the skulls. I don't liquor when I'm training. How about you? I'm reading hard. I think it best to leave it alone. Hasty nodded, and they relapsed into a contented silence. By the way, Smith, asked Hasty presently, have you made the acquaintance of either of the fellows on your stair yet? Just a nod when we pass, nothing more. Hmm, I should be inclined to let it stand at that. I know something of them both, not much, but as much as I want. I don't think I should take them to my bosom if I were you. Not that there's much amiss with Monkhouse Lee, meaning the thin one. Precisely. He's a gentlemanly little fellow. I don't think there is any vice in him, but then you can't know him without knowing Bellingham. Meaning the fat one. Yes, the fat one. And he's a man whom I, for one, would rather not know. Abercrombie Smith raised his eyebrows and glanced across at his companion. What's up, then? he asked. Drink? Cards? Cad? You used not to be censorious. Ah, you evidently don't know the man or you wouldn't ask. There's something damnable about him, something reptilian. My gorge always rises at him. I should put him down as a man with secret vices, an evil liver. He's no fool, though. They say that he is one of the best men in his line that they have ever had in the college, medicine or classics. Eastern languages, he's a demon at them. Chillingworth met him somewhere above the second cataract last long, and he told me that he just prattled to the Arabs as if he had been born and nursed and weaned among them. He talked Coptic to the Copts, and Hebrew to the Jews, and Arabic to the Bedouins, and they were all ready to kiss the hem of his frock coat. There are some old hermit johnnies up in those parts who sit on rocks and scowl and spit at the casual stranger. Well, when they saw this chap Bellingham, before he had said five words, they just lay down on their bellies and wriggled. Chillingworth said that he never saw anything like it. Bellingham seemed to take it as his right, too, and strutted about among them and talked down to them like a Dutch uncle. Pretty good for an undergrad of olds, wasn't it? Why do you say you can't know Lee without knowing Bellingham? Because Bellingham is engaged to his sister Eveline. Such a bright little girl, Smith. I know the whole family well. It's disgusting to see that brute with her. A toad and a dove. That's what they always remind me of. Abercrombie Smith grinned and knocked his ashes out against the side of the grate. You show every card in your hand, old chap, said he. What a prejudiced, green-eyed, evil-thinking old man it is. You have really nothing against the fellow except that. Well, I've known her ever since she was as long as that cherry wood pipe, and I don't like to see her taking risks, and it is a risk. He looks beastly, and he has a beastly temper, a venomous temper. You remember his row with Long Norton? No. You always forget that I'm a freshman. Ah, it was last winter, of course. Well, you know the towpath along by the river? There were several fellows going along it, Bellingham in front, when they came on an old market woman coming the other way. It had been raining. You know what those fields are like when it is rained, and the path ran between the river and a great puddle that was nearly as broad. <laughs> well, what does this swine do but keep the path and push the old girl into the mud, where she and her marketings came to terrible grief? 
It was a blackguard thing to do, and Long Norton, who is as gentle a fellow as ever stepped, told him what he thought of it. One word led to another, and it ended in Norton laying his stick across the fellow's shoulders. There was the deuce of a fuss about it, and it's a treat to see the way in which Bellingham looks at Norton when they meet now. By Jove, Smith, it's nearly eleven o'clock. No hurry, light your pipe again. Not I. I'm supposed to be in training. Here I've been sitting gossiping when I ought to have been safely tucked up. I'll borrow your skull if I can share it. Williams has had mine for a month. I'll take the little bones of your ear, too, if you are sure you won't need them. <laughs> Thanks very much. Never mind a bag. I can carry them very well under my arm. Good night, my son, and take my tip as to your neighbour. When Hasty, bearing his anatomical plunder, had clattered off down the winding stair, Abercrombie Smith hurled his pipe into the waste paper basket, and drawing his chair nearer to the lamp, plunged into a formidable green-covered volume, adorned with great coloured maps of that strange internal kingdom of which we are the hapless and helpless monarchs. Though a freshman at Oxford, the student was not so in medicine, for he had worked for four years at Glasgow and at Berlin, and this coming examination would place him finally as a member of his profession. With his firm mouth, broad forehead and clear-cut, somewhat hard-featured face, he was a man who, if he had no brilliant talent, was yet so dogged, so patient and so strong, that he might in the end overtop a more showy genius, a man who can hold his own among Scotchmen and North Germans, is not a man to be easily set back. Smith had left a name at Glasgow and at Berlin, and he was bent now upon doing as much at Oxford, if hard work and devotion could accomplish it. He had sat reading for about an hour, and the hands of the noisy carriage clock upon the side table were rapidly closing together upon the twelve when a sudden sound fell upon the student's ear, a sharp, rather shrill sound, like the hissing intake of a man's breath who gasps under some strong emotion. Smith laid down his book and slanted his ear to listen. There was no one on either side or above him, so that the interruption came certainly from the neighbour beneath, the same neighbour of whom Hasty had given so unsavoury an account. Smith knew him only as a flabby, pale-faced man of silent and studious habits, a man whose lamp threw a golden bar from the old turret, even after he had extinguished his own. This community in lateness had formed a certain silent bond between them. It was soothing to Smith, when the hours stole on towards dawning, to feel that there was another so close, who set a smaller value upon his sleep as he did. Even now, as his thoughts turned towards him, Smith's feelings were kindly. Hasty was a good fellow, but he was rough, strong-fibred, with no imagination or sympathy. He could not tolerate departures from what he looked upon as the model type of manliness. If a man could not be measured by a public school standard, then he was beyond the pale with Hasty. Like so many who are themselves robust, he was apt to confuse the constitution with the character, to ascribe to want of principle what was really a want of circulation. Smith, with his stronger mind, knew his friend's habit, and made allowance for it now, as his thoughts turned towards the man beneath him. There was no return of the singular sound, and Smith was about to turn to his work once more, when suddenly there broke out in the silence of the night a hoarse cry, a positive scream, the call of a man who is moved and shaken beyond all control. Smith sprang out of his chair and dropped his book. He was a man of fairly firm fibre, but there was something in this sudden, uncontrollable shriek of horror which chilled his blood and pringled in his skin. Coming in such a place, and at such an hour, it brought a thousand fantastic possibilities into his head. Should he rush down, or was it better to wait? He had all the natural hatred of making a scene, and he knew so little of his neighbour that he would not lightly intrude upon his affairs. For a moment he stood in doubt, 
and even as he balanced the matter there was a quick rattle of footsteps upon the stairs, and young Monkhouse Lee, half-dressed and as white as ashes, burst into his room. "'Come down!' he gasped. "'Bellingham's ill!' Abercrombie Smith followed him closely downstairs into the sitting-room, which was beneath his own, and, intent as he was upon the matter in hand, he could not but take an amazed glance around him as he crossed the threshold. It was such a chamber as he had never seen before, a museum rather than a study. Walls and ceiling were thickly covered with a thousand strange relics from Egypt and the East. Tall, angular figures, bearing burdens or weapons, stalked in an uncouth frieze round the apartments. Above were bull-headed, stork-headed, cat-headed, owl-headed statues, with viper-crowned, almond-eyed monarchs, and strange, beetle-like deities cut out of the blue Egyptian lapis lazuli. Horus and Isis and Osiris peered down from every niche and shelf, while across the ceiling a true son of old Nile, a great hanging-jawed crocodile, was slung in a double noose. In the centre of this singular chamber was a large square table, littered with papers, bottles, and the dried leaves of some graceful palm-like plant. These varied objects had all been heaped together in order to make room for a mummy case, which had been conveyed from the wall, as was evident from the gap there, and laid across the front of the table. The mummy itself, a horrid, black, withered thing, like a charred head on a gnarled bush, was lying half out of the case, with its claw-like hand and bony forearm resting upon the table. Propped up against the sarcophagus was an old yellow scroll of papyrus, and in front of it, in a wooden armchair, sat the owner of the room, his head thrown back, his widely opened eyes directed in a horrified stare to the crocodile above him, and his blue, thick lips puffing loudly with every expiration. "'My God, he's dying!' cried Monkhouse Lee, distractedly. He was a slim, handsome young fellow, olive-skinned and dark-eyed, of a Spanish rather than of an English type, with a Celtic intensity of manner which contrasted with the Saxon phlegm of Abercrombie Smith. Only a faint, I think, said the medical student. Just give me a hand with him. You take his feet. Now on to the sofa. Can you kick all those little wooden devils off? What a litter it is. Now he will be all right if we undo his collar and give him some water. What has he been up to at all? I don't know. I heard him cry out. I ran up. I know him pretty well, you know. It is very good of you to come down. His heart is going like a pair of castanets, said Smith, laying his hand on the breast of the unconscious man. He seems to me to be frightened all to pieces. Chuck the water over him. What a face he has got on him. It was indeed a strange and most repellent face, for colour and outline were equally unnatural. It was white, not with the ordinary pallor of fear, but with an absolutely bloodless white, like the underside of a soul. He was very fat, but gave the impression of having at some time been considerably fatter, for his skin hung loosely in creases and folds, and was shot with a meshwork of wrinkles. Short, stubbly brown hair bristled up from his scalp, with a pair of thick, wrinkled ears protruding at the sides. His light grey eyes were still open, the pupils dilated, and the balls projecting in a fixed and horrid stare. It seemed to Smith, as he looked down upon him, that he had never seen nature's danger signals flying so plainly upon a man's countenance, and his thoughts turned more seriously to the warning which Hasty had given him an hour before. What the deuce can have frightened him so? he asked. It's the mummy. The mummy? How, then? I don't know. It's beastly and morbid. I wish he would drop it. It's the second fright he has given me. It was the same last winter. I found him just like this, with that horrid thing in front of him. What does he want with the mummy, then? Oh, he's a crank, you know. It's his hobby. He knows more about these things than any man in England. 
but I wish he wouldn't. Ah, he's beginning to come too. A faint tinge of colour had begun to steal back into Bellingham's ghastly cheeks, and his eyelids shivered like a sail after a calm. He clasped and unclasped his hands, drew a long thin breath between his teeth, and suddenly, jerking up his head, threw a glance of recognition around him. As his eyes fell upon the mummy, he sprang off the sofa, seized the roll of papyrus, thrust it into a drawer, turned the key, and staggered back onto the sofa. "'What's up?' he asked. "'What do you chaps want?' "'You've been shrieking out and making no end of a fuss,' said Monkhouse Lee. "'If our neighbour here from above hadn't come down, I'm sure I don't know what I should have done with you.' "'Ah, it's Abercrombie Smith,' said Bellingham, glancing up at him. "'How very good of you to come in. What a fool I am. Oh, my God, what a fool I am!' He sank his head onto his hands, and burst into peal after peal of hysterical laughter. "'Look here, drop it!' cried Smith, shaking him roughly by the shoulder. "'Your nerves are all in a jangle. You must drop these little midnight games with mummies, or you'll be going off your chump.' You're all on wires now. I wonder, said Bellingham, whether you would be as cool as I am if you had seen... What then? Oh, nothing. I meant that I wonder if you would sit up at night with a mummy without trying your nerves. I have no doubt that you are quite right. I dare say that I have been taking it out of myself too much lately. But I'm all right now. Oh, please don't go, though. Just wait for a few minutes until I am quite myself. The room is very close, remarked Lee, throwing open the window and letting in the cool night air. It's balsamic resin, said Bellingham. He lifted up one of the dried palmate leaves from the table and frizzled it over the chimney of the lamp. It broke away into heavy smoke wreaths, and a pungent, biting odour filled the chamber. It's the sacred plant, the plant of the priests, he remarked. Do you know anything of Eastern languages, Smith? Nothing at all, not a word. The answer seemed to lift a weight from the Egyptologist's mind. By the way, he continued, how long was it from the time that you ran down until I came to my senses? Not long, some four or five minutes. I thought it could not be very long, said he, drawing a long breath. But what a strange thing unconsciousness is. There is no measurement to it. I could not tell from my own sensations if it were seconds or weeks. Now that gentleman on the table was packed up in the days of the Eleventh Dynasty, some forty centuries ago, and yet, if he could find his tongue, he would tell us that this lapse of time has been but a closing of the eyes and a reopening of them. He is a singularly fine mummy, Smith. Smith stepped over to the table and looked down with a professional eye at the black and twisted form in front of him. The features, though horribly discoloured, were perfect, and two little nut-like eyes still lurked in the depths of the black, hollow sockets. The blotched skin was drawn tightly from bone to bone, and a tangled wrap of black, coarse hair fell over the ears. Two twin teeth, like those of a rat, overlay the shriveled lower lip. In its crouching position, with bent joints and craned head, there was a suggestion of energy about the horrid thing, which made Smith's gorge rise. The gaunt ribs, with their parchment-like covering, were exposed, and the sunken, leaden-hued abdomen, with the long slit where the embalmer had left his mark. But the lower limbs were wrapped round with coarse yellow bandages. A number of little clove-like pieces of myrrh and of cassia were sprinkled over the body, and lay scattered on the inside of the case. "'I don't know his name,' said Bellingham, passing his hand over the shriveled head. You see, the outer sarcophagus with the inscriptions is missing. Lot 249 is all the title he has now. You see it printed on his case. 
That was the number in the auction at which I picked him up. He has been a very pretty sort of fellow in his day, remarked Abercrombie Smith. He has been a giant. His mummy is six feet seven in length, and that would be a giant over there, for they were never a very robust race. Feel these great knotted bones, too. He would be a nasty fellow to tackle. Perhaps these very hands helped to build the stones into the pyramids, suggested Monkhouse Lee, looking down with disgust in his eyes at the crooked, unclean talons. No fear, this fellow has been pickled in natron, and looked after in the most approved style. They did not serve hodsmen in that fashion. Salt or bitumen was enough for them. It has been calculated that this sort of thing cost about seven hundred and thirty pounds in our money. Our friend was a noble, at the least. What do you make of that small inscription near his feet, Smith? I told you that I know no eastern tongue. Ah, so you did. It is the name of the embalmer, I take it. A very conscientious worker he must have been. I wonder how many modern works will survive four thousand years. He kept on speaking lightly and rapidly, but it was evident to Abercrombie Smith that he was still palpitating with fear. His hands shook, his lower lip trembled, and look where he would, his eye always came sliding round to his gruesome companion. Through all his fear, however, there was a suspicion of triumph in his tone and manner. His eyes shone, and his footstep as he paced the room was brisk and jaunty. He gave the impression of a man who has gone through an ordeal, the marks of which he still bears upon him, but which has helped him to his end. "'You're not going yet!' he cried, as Smith rose from the sofa. At the prospect of solitude his fears seemed to crowd back upon him, and he stretched out a hand to detain him. "'Yes, I must go. I have my work to do. You're all right now.' I think that with your nervous system you should take up a less morbid study. Oh, I am not nervous as a rule, and I have unwrapped mummies before. You fainted last time, observed Monk Housley. Ah, yes, so I did. Well, I must have a nerve tonic or a course of electricity. You are not going, Lee. I'll do whatever you wish, Ned. Then I'll come down with you and have a shakedown on your sofa. Good night, Smith. I am so sorry to have disturbed you with my foolishness. They shook hands, and as the medical student stumbled up the spiral and irregular stair, he heard a key turn in a door, and the steps of his two new acquaintances as they descended to the lower floor. In this strange way began the acquaintance between Edward Bellingham and Abercrombie Smith, an acquaintance which the latter, at least, had no desire to push further. Bellingham, however, appeared to have taken a fancy to his rough-spoken neighbour, and made his advances in such a way that he could hardly be repulsed without absolute brutality. Twice he called to thank Smith for his assistance, and many times afterwards he looked in with books, papers, and such other civilities as two bachelor neighbours can offer each other. He was... Smith soon found a man of wide reading, with Catholic tastes and an extraordinary memory. His manner, too, was so pleasing and suave that one came, after a time, to overlook his repellent appearance. For a jaded and wearied man he was no unpleasant companion, and Smith found himself, after a time, looking forward to his visits, and even returning them. Clever as he undoubtedly was, however, the medical student seemed to detect a dash of insanity in the man. He broke out at times into a high, inflated style of talk, which was in contrast with the simplicity of his life. "'It is a wonderful thing,' he cried, "'to feel that one can command powers of good and of evil, a ministering angel or a demon of vengeance.' And again, of Monkhouse Lee, he said, Lee is a good fellow, an honest fellow, but he is without strength or ambition. He would not make a fit partner for a man with a great enterprise. He would not make a fit partner for me. 
At such hints and innuendos, stolid Smith, puffing solemnly at his pipe, would simply raise his eyebrows and shake his head, with little interjections of medical wisdom as to earlier hours and fresher air. One habit Bellingham had developed of late, which Smith knew to be a frequent herald of a weakening mind. He appeared to be forever talking to himself. At late hours of the night, when there could be no visitor with him, Smith could still hear his voice beneath him in a low, muffled monologue, sunk almost to a whisper, and yet very audible in the silence. This solitary babbling annoyed and distracted the student, so that he spoke more than once to his neighbour about it. Bellingham, however, flushed up at the charge, and denied curtly that he had uttered a sound. Indeed, he showed more annoyance over the matter than the occasion seemed to demand. Had Abercrombie Smith had any doubt as to his own ears, he had not to go far to find corroboration. Tom Stiles, the little wrinkled manservant who had attended to the wants of the lodgers in the turret for a longer time than any man's memory could carry him, was sorely put to it over the same matter. If you please, sir, said he, as he tidied down the top chamber one morning. Do you think Mr. Bellingham is all right, sir? All right, Stiles. Yes, sir. Right in the head, sir. Why should he not be, then? Well, I don't know, sir. His habits has changed of late. He's not the same man he used to be, though I make free to say that he was never quite one of my gentlemen, like Mr. Hasty or yourself, sir. He's took to talking to himself something awful. I wonder it don't disturb you. I don't know what to make of him, sir. I don't know what business it is of your styles. Well, I takes an interest, Mr. Smith. It may be forward of me, but I can't help it. I feel sometimes as if I was mother and father to my young gentleman. It all falls on me when things go wrong, and the relations come. But, Mr. Bellingham, sir, I want to know what it is that walks about his room sometimes when he's out and when the door's locked on the outside. Eh? You're talking nonsense, Styles. Maybe so, sir. But I heard it more than once, with my own ears. Rubbish, Styles. Very good, sir. You'll ring the bell if you want me. Abercrombie Smith gave little heed to the gossip of the old manservant, but a small incident occurred a few days later which left an unpleasant effect upon his mind and brought the words of Styles forcibly to his memory. Bellingham had come up to see him late one night, and was entertaining him with an interesting account of the rock tombs of Beni Hassan in Upper Egypt, when Smith, whose hearing was remarkably acute, distinctly heard the sound of a door opening on the landing below. "'There's some fellow gone in or out of your room,' he remarked, Bellingham sprang up and stood helpless for a moment, with the expression of a man who is half incredulous and half afraid. "'I surely locked it. I am almost positive that I locked it,' he stammered. "'No one could have opened it.' "'Why, I hear someone coming up the stairs now,' said Smith. Bellingham rushed out through the door, slammed it loudly behind him, and hurried down the stairs. About halfway down, Smith heard him stop and thought he caught the sound of whispering. A moment later the door beneath him shut, a key creaked in a lock, and Bellingham, with beads of moisture upon his pale face, ascended the stairs once more and re-entered the room. "'It's all right,' he said, throwing himself down in a chair. "'It was that fool of a dog. He had pushed the door open. I don't know how I came to forget to lock it.' I didn't know you kept a dog, said Smith, looking very thoughtfully at the disturbed face of his companion. Yes, I haven't had him long. Oh, I must get rid of him. He's a great nuisance. He must be, if you find it so hard to shut him up. I should have thought that shutting the door would have been enough without locking it. I want to prevent old Styles from letting him out. He's of some value, you know, and it would be awkward to lose him. I am a bit of a dog fancier myself, said Smith, still gazing hard at his companion from the corner of his eyes. Perhaps you'll let me have a look at it. Certainly, 
but I'm afraid it cannot be tonight. I have an appointment. Is that clock right? Then I am a quarter of an hour late already. You'll excuse me, I am sure. He picked up his cap and hurried from the room. In spite of his appointment, Smith heard him re-enter his own chamber and lock his door upon the inside. This interview left a disagreeable impression upon the medical student's mind. Bellingham had lied to him, and lied so clumsily that it looked as if he had desperate reasons for concealing the truth. Smith knew that his neighbour had no dog. He knew also that the step which he had heard upon the stairs was not the step of an animal. But if it were not, then what could it be? There was old Stiles's statement about the something which used to pace the room at times when the owner was absent. Could it be a woman? Smith rather inclined to the view. If so, it would mean disgrace and expulsion to Bellingham if it were discovered by the authorities, so that his anxiety and falsehoods might be accounted for. And yet it was inconceivable that an undergraduate could keep a woman in his rooms without being instantly detected. Be the explanation what it might, there was something ugly about it, and Smith determined, as he turned to his books, to discourage all further attempts at intimacy on the part of his soft-spoken and ill-favoured neighbour but his work was destined to interruption that night. He had hardly caught up the broken threads when a firm, heavy footfall came three steps at a time from below, and Hasty, in blazer and flannels, burst into the room. "'Still at it?' said he, plumping down into his wonted armchair. "'What a chap you are to stew! "'I believe an earthquake might come and knock Oxford into a cocked hat "'and you would sit perfectly placid with your books among the ruins. "'However, I won't bore you long. Three whiffs of backy, and I'm off.' "'What's the news, then?' asked Smith, "'cramming a plug of bird's eye into his briar with his forefinger. "'Nothing very much. "'Wilson made seventy for the freshman against the eleven. "'They say that they will play him instead of Buddicombe. "'for Buttercombe is clean off colour. "'He used to be able to bowl a little, "'but it's nothing but half volleys and long hops now.' "'Medium right,' suggested Smith, "'with the intense gravity which comes upon a varsity man "'when he speaks of athletics. "'Inclining to fast with the work from leg, "'comes with the arm about three inches or so. "'He used to be nasty on a wet wicket. "'Oh, uh, by the way, have you heard about Long Norton? "'What's that? "'He's been attacked. "'Attacked?' Yes, just as he was turning out of the high street and within a hundred yards of the gate of Olds. But who? Ah, that's the rub. If you said what, you would be more grammatical. Norton swears that it was not human, and indeed, from the scratches on his throat, I should be inclined to agree with him. What then? Have we come down to spooks? Abercrombie Smith puffed his scientific contempt. Well, no, I don't think that is quite the idea either. I'm inclined to think that if any showman has lost a great ape lately, and the brute is in these parts, a jury would find a true bill against it. Norton passes that way every night, you know, about the same hour. There's a tree that hangs low over the path, the big elm from Rainey's garden. Norton thinks the thing dropped on him out of the tree. Anyway, he was nearly strangled by two arms, which, he says, were as strong and as thin as steel bands. He saw nothing, only those beastly arms that tightened and tightened on him. He yelled his head nearly off, and a couple of chaps came running, and the thing went over the wall like a cat. He never got a fair sight of it the whole time. It gave Norton a shake-up, I can tell you. I tell him it has been as good as a change at the seaside for him. A garotta, most likely, said Smith. Very possibly. Norton says not, but we don't mind what he says. The garotta had long nails and was pretty smart at swinging himself over walls. By the way, your beautiful neighbour would be pleased if he heard about it. He had a grudge against Norton, and he's not a man, from what I know of him, to forget his little debts. But hello, old chap. What have you got in your noddle? Nothing, Smith answered curtly. He had started in his chair and the look had flashed over his face. 
which comes upon a man who is struck suddenly by some unpleasant idea. You looked as if something I had said had taken you on the raw. By the way, you have made the acquaintance of Master B since I looked in last, have you not? Young Monkhouse Lee told me something to that effect. Yes, I know him slightly. He has been up here once or twice. Well, you're big enough and ugly enough to take care of yourself. He's not what I should call exactly a healthy sort of Johnny, though no doubt he's very clever and all that, but you'll soon find out for yourself. Lee is all right. He's a very decent little fellow. Well, so long, old chap. I row Mullins for the Vice-Chancellor's pot on Wednesday week. So mind you come down, in case I don't see you before. Bovine Smith laid down his pipe and turned stolidly to his books once more. But with all the will in the world, he found it very hard to keep his mind upon his work. It would slip away to brood upon the man beneath him and upon the little mystery which hung round his chambers. Then his thoughts turned to this singular attack of which Hasty had spoken, and to the grudge which Bellingham was said to owe to the object of it. The two ideas would persist in rising together in his mind, as though there were some close and intimate connection between them. And yet the suspicion was so dim and vague that it could not be put down in words. Confound the chap, cried Smith, as he shied his book on pathology across the room. He has spoiled my night's reading. And that's reason enough, if there were no other, why I should steer clear of him in the future. For ten days the medical student confined himself so closely to his studies that he neither saw nor heard anything of either of the men beneath him. At the hours when Bellingham had been accustomed to visit him, he took care to sport his oak, and though he more than once heard a knocking at his outer door, he resolutely refused to answer it. One afternoon, however, he was descending the stairs when, just as he was passing it, Bellingham's door flew open, and young Monkhouse Lee came out with his eyes sparkling and a dark flush of anger upon his olive cheeks. Close at his heels followed Bellingham, his fat, unhealthy face all quivering with malignant passion. "'You fool!' he hissed. "'You'll be sorry!' "'Very likely!' cried the other. "'Mind what I say. It's off. I won't hear of it. You've promised anyhow. Oh, I'll keep that. I won't speak. But I'd rather little Eva was in her grave. Once for all, it's off. She'll do what I say. We don't want to see you again.' So much Smith could not avoid hearing, but he hurried on, for he had no wish to be involved in their dispute. There had been a serious breach between them, that was clear enough, and Lee was going to cause the engagement with his sister to be broken off. Smith thought of Hasty's comparison of the toad and the dove, and was glad to think that the matter was at an end. Bellingham's face, when he was in a passion, was not pleasant to look upon. He was not a man to whom an innocent girl could be trusted for life. As he walked, Smith wondered languidly what could have caused the quarrel, and what the promise might be which Bellingham had been so anxious that Monkhouse Lee should keep. It was the day of the sculling match between Hasty and Mullins, and a stream of men were making their way down to the banks of the Isis. A May sun was shining brightly and the yellow path was barred with the black shadows of tall elm trees. On either side the grey colleges lay back from the road, the hoary old mothers of mines looking out from their high, mullioned windows at the tide of young life which swept so merrily past them. Black-clad tutors, prim officials, pale reading men, brown-faced, straw-hatted young athletes in white sweaters, or many-coloured blazers, all were hurrying towards the blue, winding river which curves through the Oxford meadows. Abercrombie Smith, with the intuition of an old oarsman, chose his position at the point where he knew that the struggle, if there were a struggle, would come. Far off he heard the hum which announced the start, the gathering roar of the approach, the thunder of running feet, and the shouts of the men in the boats beneath him. 
A spray of half-clad, deep-breathing runners shot past him, and craning over their shoulders, he saw Hasty pulling a steady thirty-six, while his opponent, with a jerky forty, was a good boat's length behind him. Smith gave a cheer for his friend, and pulling out his watch was starting off again for his chambers, when he felt a touch upon his shoulder and found that young Monkhouse Lee was beside him. I saw you there, he said, in a timid, deprecating way. I wanted to speak to you, if you could spare me a half hour. This cottage is mine. I share it with Harrington of King's. Come in and uh, have a cup of tea. I must be back presently, said Smith. I'm hard on the grind at present, but I'll come in for a few minutes with pleasure. I wouldn't have come out, only hasty as a friend of mine. So he is of mine. Hasn't he a beautiful style? Mullins wasn't in it. But come into the cottage. It's a little den of a place, but it is pleasant to work in during the summer months. It was a small square white building, with green doors and shutters, and a rustic trellis-work porch, standing back some fifty yards from the river's bank. Inside the main room was roughly fitted up as a study, deal table, unpainted shelves with books, and a few cheap oleographs upon the wall. A kettle sang upon a spirit stove, and there were tea things upon a tray on the table. Try that chair and have a cigarette, said Lee. Let me pour you out a cup of tea. It's so good of you to come in, for I know that your time is a good deal taken up. I wanted to say to you that, if I were you, I should change my rooms at once. Eh? Smith sat staring at a lighted match in one hand, and his unlit cigarette in the other. Yes, it must seem very extraordinary, and the worst of it is that I cannot give my reasons, for I am under a solemn promise, a very solemn promise. But I may go so far as to say that I don't think Bellingham is a very safe man to live near. I intend to camp out here as much as I can for a time. Not safe? What do you mean? Ah, that's what I mustn't say. But do take my advice and move your rooms. We had a grand row today. You must have heard us, for you came down the stairs. I saw that you had fallen out. He's a horrible chap, Smith. That is the only word for him. I have had doubts about him ever since that night when he fainted. You remember when you came down. I taxed him today, and he told me things that made my hair rise, and wanted me to stand in with him. I'm not straight-laced, but I am a clergyman's son, you know, and I think there are some things which are quite beyond the pale. I only thank God that I found him out before it was too late. This is all very fine, Lee, said Abercrombie Smith curtly, but either you are saying a great deal too much or a great deal too little. I give you a warning. If there is real reason for warning, no promise can bind you. If I see a rascal about to blow a place up with dynamite, no pledge will stand in my way of preventing him. Ah, but I cannot prevent him, and I can do nothing but warn you, without saying what you warn me against. Against Bellingham. But that is childish. Why should I fear him, or any man? I can't tell you. I can only entreat you to change your rooms. You are in danger where you are. I don't even say that Bellingham would wish to injure you, but it might happen, for he is a dangerous neighbour just now. Perhaps I know more than you think, said Smith, looking keenly at the young man's boyish, earnest face. Suppose I tell you that someone else shares Bellingham's rooms. Monkhouse Lee sprang from his chair in uncontrollable excitement. You know, then, he gasped, a woman. Lee dropped back again with a groan. My lips are sealed, he said. I must not speak. Well, anyhow, said Smith, rising, it is not likely that I should allow myself to be frightened out of rooms which suit me very nicely. It would be a little too feeble for me to move out all my goods and chattels, because you say that Bellingham might in some unexplained way do me an injury. I think that I'll just take my chance, and stay where I am, and as I see that it's nearly five o'clock, I must ask you to excuse me. He bade the young student adieu in a few curt words, and made his way homeward through the sweet spring evening, feeling half ruffled, half amused. 
as any other strong, unimaginative man might who has been menaced by a vague and shadowy danger. There was one little indulgence which Abercrombie Smith always allowed himself, however closely his work might press upon him. Twice a week, on the Tuesday and the Friday, it was his invariable custom to walk over to Farlingford, the residence of Dr. Plumptree Peterson, situated about a mile and a half out of Oxford. Peterson had been a close friend of Smith's elder brother, Francis, and, as he was a bachelor, fairly well-to-do, with a good cellar and a better library, his house was a pleasant goal for a man who was in need of a brisk walk. Twice a week, then, the medical student would swing out there along the dark country roads and spend a pleasant hour in Peterson's comfortable study, discussing, over a glass of old port, the gossip of the varsity or the latest developments of medicine or of surgery. On the day which followed his interview with Monkhouse Lee, Smith shut up his books at a quarter past eight, the hour when he usually started for his friend's house. As he was leaving his room, however, his eyes chanced to fall upon one of the books which Bellingham had lent him, and his conscience pricked him for not having returned it. However repellent the man might be, he should not be treated with discourtesy. Taking the book, he walked downstairs and knocked at his neighbour's door. There was no answer, but on turning the handle he found that it was unlocked. Pleased at the thought of avoiding an interview, he stepped inside and placed the book with his card upon the table. The lamp was turned half down, but Smith could see the details of the room plainly enough. It was all much as he had seen it before, the frieze, the animal-headed gods, the hanging crocodile, and the table littered over with papers and dried leaves. The mummy case stood upright against the wall, but the mummy itself was missing. There was no sign of any second occupant of the room, and he felt, as he withdrew, that he had probably done Bellingham an injustice. Had he a guilty secret to preserve, he would hardly leave his door open so that all the world might enter. The spiral stair was as black as pitch, and Smith was slowly making his way down its irregular steps when he was suddenly conscious that something had passed him in the darkness. There was a faint sound, a whiff of air, a light brushing past his elbow, but so slight that he could scarcely be certain of it. He stopped and listened, but the wind was rustling among the ivy outside, and he could hear nothing else. "'Is that you, Styles? he shouted. There was no answer, and all was still behind him. It must have been a sudden gust of air, for there were crannies and cracks in the old turret, and yet he could almost have sworn that he heard a footfall by his very side. He had emerged into the quadrangle, still turning the matter over in his head, when a man came running swiftly across the smooth-cropped lawn. "'Is that you, Smith? Hello, Hasty. For God's sake, come at once. Young Lee is drowned. Here's Harrington of King's with the news. The doctor is out. You'll do, but come along at once. There may be life in him. Have you brandy? No. I'll bring some. There's a flask on my table.' Smith bounded up the stairs, taking three at a time, seized the flask, and was rushing down with it when, as he passed Bellingham's room, his eyes fell upon something which left him gasping and staring upon the landing. The door, which he had closed behind him, was now open, and right in front of him, with the lamplight shining upon it, was the mummy case. Three minutes ago it had been empty, he could swear to that. Now it framed the lank body of its horrible occupant, who stood grim and stark, with his black, shriveled face towards the door. The form was lifeless and inert, but it seemed to Smith, as he gazed, that there still lingered a lurid spark of vitality, some faint sign of consciousness in the little eyes which lurked in the depths of the hollow sockets. So astounded and shaken was he that he had forgotten his errand, and was still staring at the lean, sunken figure when the voice of his friend below recalled him to himself. "'Come on, Smith!' he shouted. "'It's life and death, you know. Hurry up!' 
Now then, he added, as the medical student reappeared, let us do a sprint. It is well under a mile, and we should do it in five minutes. A human life is better worth running for than a pot. Neck and neck they dashed through the darkness, and did not pull up until, panting and spent, they had reached the little cottage by the river. Young Lee, limp and dripping like a broken water plant, was stretched upon the sofa, the green scum of the river upon his black hair, and a fringe of white foam upon his leaden-hued lips. Beside him knelt his fellow student, Harrington, endeavouring to chafe some warmth back into his rigid limbs. I think there's life in him, said Smith, with his hand to the lad's side. Put your watch glass to his lips. Yes, there's dimming on it. You take one arm, Hasty. Now work it as I do, and we'll soon pull him round. For ten minutes they worked in silence, inflating and depressing the chest of the unconscious man. At the end of that time, a shiver ran through his body, his lips trembled, and he opened his eyes. The three students burst out into an irrepressible cheer. Wake up, old chap! You've frightened us quite enough. Have some brandy. Take a sip from the flask. He's all right now, said his companion, Harrington. Heavens, what a fright I got! I was reading here, and he had gone out for a stroll as far as the river, when I heard a scream and a splash. Out I ran, and by the time I could find him and fish him out, all life seemed to have gone. Then Simpson couldn't get a doctor, for he has a game leg, and I had to run. And I don't know what I'd have done without you fellows. That's right, old chap. Sit up. Monkhouse Lee had raised himself on his hands and looked wildly about him. What's up? he asked. I've been in the water. Ah, yes, I remember. A look of fear came into his eyes, and he sank his face into his hands. How did you fall in? I didn't fall in. How then? I was thrown in. I was standing by the bank, and something from behind picked me up like a feather and hurled me in. I heard nothing, and I saw nothing. But I know what it was for all that. And so do I, whispered Smith. Lee looked up with a quick glance of surprise. You've learned then, he said. You remember the advice I gave you? Yes, and I begin to think that I shall take it. I don't know what the deuce you fellows are talking about, said Hasty, but I think, if I were you, Harrington, I should get Lee to bed at once. It will be time enough to discuss the why and the wherefore when he is a little stronger. I think, Smith, you and I can leave him alone now. I'm walking back to the college, if you're coming in that direction. We can have a chat. But it was little chat that they had upon their homeward path. Smith's mind was too full of the incidents of the evening the absence of the mummy from his neighbour's rooms, the step that passed him on the stair, the reappearance, the extraordinary, inexplicable reappearance of the grisly thing, and then this attack upon Lee, corresponding so closely to the previous outrage upon another man against whom Bellingham bore a grudge. All this settled in his thoughts together with the many little incidents which had previously turned him against his neighbour, and the singular circumstances under which he was first called in to him. What had been a dim suspicion, a vague, fantastic conjecture, had suddenly taken form, and stood out in his mind as a grim fact, a thing not to be denied. And yet, how monstrous it was, how unheard of, how entirely beyond all bounds of human experience, an impartial judge, or even the friend who walked by his side, would simply tell him that his eyes had deceived him, that the mummy had been there all the time, that young Lee had tumbled into the river as any other man tumbles into a river, and the blue pill was the best thing for a disordered liver. He felt that he would have said as much if the positions had been reversed and yet he could swear that Bellingham was a murderer at heart, and that he wielded a weapon such as no man had ever used in all the grim history of crime. Hasty had branched off to his rooms with a few crisp and emphatic comments upon his friend's unsociability, and Abercrombie Smith crossed the quadrangle to his corner turret with a strong feeling of repulsion for his chambers, and their associations. 
He would take Lee's advice and move his quarters as soon as possible. For how could a man study when his ear was forever straining for every murmur or footstep in the room below? He observed, as he crossed over the lawn, that the light was still shining in Bellingham's window, and as he passed up the staircase the door opened and the man himself looked out at him. With his fat, evil face, he was like some bloated spider fresh from the weaving of his poisonous web. "'Good evening,' said he. "'Won't you come in?' "'No,' cried Smith fiercely. "'No, you are as busy as ever. I wanted to ask you about Lee. I was sorry to hear that there was a rumour that something was amiss with him. His features were grave, but there was the gleam of a hidden laugh in his eyes as he spoke. Smith saw it, and he could have knocked him down for it. "'You'll be sorrier still to hear that Monkhouse Lee is doing very well and is out of all danger,' he answered. "'Your hellish tricks have not come off this time. Oh, you needn't try to brazen it out. I know all about it.' Bellingham took a step back from the angry student, and half closed the door as if to protect himself. "'You are mad,' he said. "'What do you mean?' Do you assert that I had anything to do with Lee's accident? Yes, thundered Smith. You and that bag of bones behind you. You worked it between you. I tell you what it is, Master B. They have given up burning folks like you, but we still keep a hangman. And by George, if any man in this college meets his death while you are here, I'll have you up. And if you don't swing for it, it won't be my fault. You'll find that your filthy Egyptian tricks won't answer in England. You're a raving lunatic said Bellingham. All right, you just remember what I say, for you'll find that I'll be better than my word. The door slammed, and Smith went fuming up to his chamber, where he locked the door upon the inside and spent half the night in smoking his old briar and brooding over the strange events of the evening. Next morning Abercrombie Smith heard nothing of his neighbour, but Harrington called upon him in the afternoon to say that Lee was almost himself again. All day Smith stuck fast to his work, but in the evening he determined to pay the visit to his friend Dr. Peterson, upon which he had started the night before. A good walk and a friendly chat would be welcome to his jangled nerves. Bellingham's door was shut as he passed, but glancing back when he was some distance from the turret, he saw his neighbour's head at the window, outlined against the lamplight his face pressed apparently against the glass as he gazed out into the darkness. It was a blessing to be away from all contact with him, if but for a few hours, and Smith stepped out briskly and breathed the soft spring air into his lungs. The half-moon lay in the west between two gothic pinnacles and threw upon the silvered street a dark tracery from the stonework above. There was a brisk breeze, and light, fleecy clouds drifted swiftly across the sky. Olds was on the very border of the town, and in five minutes Smith found himself beyond the houses and between the hedges of a May-scented Oxfordshire lane. It was a lonely and little-frequented road which led to his friend's house. Early as it was, Smith did not meet a single soul upon his way. He walked briskly along until he came to the avenue gate, which opened into the long gravel drive leading up to Farlingford. In front of him he could see the cosy red light of the windows glimmering through the foliage. He stood with his hand upon the iron latch of the swinging gate, and he glanced back at the road along which he had come. Something was swiftly coming down it. It moved in the shadow of the hedge. Silently and furtively, a dark, crouching figure, dimly visible against the black background. Even as he gazed back at it, it had lessened its distance by twenty paces and was fast closing upon him. Out of the darkness he had a glimpse of a scraggy neck and of two eyes that will ever haunt him in his dreams. He turned, and with a cry of terror, he ran for his life up the avenue. There were the red lights, the signals of safety, almost within a stone's throw of him. He was a famous runner, but never had he run as he ran that night. The heavy gate had swung into place behind him, 
but he heard it dash open again before his pursuer. As he rushed madly and wildly through the night, he could hear a swift dry patter behind him and could see, as he threw back a glance, that this horror was bounding like a tiger at his heels, with blazing eyes and one stringy arm outthrown. Thank God, the door was ajar. He could see the thin bar of light which shot from the lamp in the hall. Nearer yet sounded the clatter from behind. He heard a horse gurgling at his very shoulder. With a shriek he flung himself against the door, slammed and bolted it behind him, and sank half-fainting onto the hall chair. "'My goodness, Smith, what's the matter?' asked Peterson, appearing at the door of his study. "'Give me some brandy!' Peterson disappeared and came rushing out again with a glass and a decanter. "'You need it,' he said, as his visitor drank off what he poured out for him. "'Why, man, you are as white as a cheese!' Smith laid down his glass, rose up, and took a deep breath. "'I am my own man again now,' said he. "'I was never so unmanned before, but with your leave, Peterson, I will sleep here tonight, for I don't think I could face that road again, except by daylight.' It's weak, I know, but I can't help it. Peterson looked at his visitor with a very questioning eye. Of course you shall sleep here if you wish. I'll tell Mrs. Burney to make up the spare bed. Where are you off to now? Come up with me to the window that overlooks the door. I want you to see what I have seen. They went up to the window of the upper hall, whence they could look down upon the approach to the house. The drive and the fields on either side lay quiet and still, bathed in the peaceful moonlight. "'Well, really, Smith,' remarked Peterson, "'it is well that I know you to be an abstemious man. What in the world can have frightened you? I'll tell you presently. But where can it have gone? Ah, now, look, look, see the curve of the road just beyond your gate? Yes, I see. You needn't pinch my arm off. I saw someone pass.' I should say a man, rather thin, apparently, and tall, very tall. But what of him? And what of yourself? You are still shaking like an aspen leaf. I have been within hand-grip of the devil, that's all. But come down to your study, and I shall tell you the whole story. He did so. Under the cheery lamplight, with a glass of wine on the table beside him, and the portly form and florid face of his friend in front, he narrated in their order all the events, great and small, which had formed so singular a chain. From the night on which he had found Bellingham fainting in front of the mummy case, until this horrid experience of an hour ago. There now, he said as he concluded, that's the whole black business. It is monstrous and incredible but it is true. Dr. Plumptree Peterson sat for some time in silence, with a very puzzled expression upon his face. "'I never heard of such a thing in my life, never,' he said at last. "'You have told me the facts. Now tell me your inferences.' "'You can draw your own, but I should like to hear yours. You have thought over the matter, and I have not. Well." It must be a little vague in detail. But the main points seem to me to be clear enough. This fellow Bellingham, in his eastern studies, has got hold of some infernal secret by which a mummy, or possibly only this particular mummy, can be temporarily brought to life. He was trying this disgusting business on the night when he fainted. No doubt the sight of the creature moving had shaken his nerve, even though he had expected it. You remember that almost the first words he said were to call out upon himself as a fool. Well, he got more hardened afterwards, and carried the matter through without fainting. The vitality which he could put into it was evidently only a passing thing, for I have seen it continually in its case, as dead as this table. He has some elaborate process, I fancy, by which he brings the thing to pass. Having done it, he naturally bethought him that he might use the creature as an agent. It has intelligence, and it has strength. For some purpose he took Lee into his confidence, but Lee, like a decent Christian, 
would have nothing to do with such a business. Then they had a row, and Lee vowed that he would tell his sister of Bellingham's true character. Bellingham's game was to prevent him, and he nearly managed it by setting this creature of his on his track. He had already tried his powers upon another man, Norton, towards whom he had a grudge. It is the merest chance that he has not two murders upon his soul. Then when I taxed him with the matter, he had the strongest reasons for wishing to get me out of the way before I could convey my knowledge to anyone else. He got his chance when I went out, for he knew my habits and where I was bound for. I have had a narrow shave, Peterson, and it is mere luck that you didn't find me on your doorstep in the morning. I'm not a nervous man as a rule, and I never thought to have the fear of death put upon me as it was tonight. My dear boy, you take the matter too seriously, said his companion. Your nerves are out of order with your work, and you make too much of it. How could such a thing as this stride about the streets of Oxford, even at night, without being seen? It has been seen. There is quite a scare in the town about an escaped ape as they imagined the creature to be. It is the talk of the place. Well, it is a striking chain of events, and yet, my dear fellow, you must allow that each incident in itself is capable of a more natural explanation. What? Even my adventure of tonight? Certainly. You come out with your nerves all unstrung, and your head full of this theory of yours, some gaunt, half-famished tramp steals after you, and seeing you run, is emboldened to pursue you. Your fears and imagination do the rest. It won't do, Peterson. It won't do. And again, in the instance of your finding the mummy case empty, and then, a few moments later, with an occupant, you know that it was lamplight, that the lamp was half-turned down and that you had no special reason to look hard at the case. It is quite possible that you may have overlooked the creature in the first instance. No, no, it is out of the question, and then Lee may have fallen into the river, and Norton been garroted. It is certainly a formidable indictment that you have against Bellingham. But if you were to place it before a police magistrate, he would simply laugh in your face. I know he would. That is why I mean to take the matter into my own hands. Eh? Yes. I feel that a public duty rests upon me. And besides, I must do it for my own safety, unless I choose to allow myself to be hunted by this beast out of the college. And that would be a little too feeble. I have quite made up my mind what I shall do. And first of all, may I use your paper and pens for an hour? Most certainly. You will find all that you want upon that side table. Abercrombie Smith sat down before a sheet of foolscap, and for an hour, and then for a second hour, his pen travelled swiftly over it. Page after page was finished and tossed aside, while his friend leaned back in his armchair, looking across at him with patient curiosity. At last, with an exclamation of satisfaction, Smith sprang to his feet and gathered his papers up into order, and laid the last one upon Peterson's desk. "'Kindly sign this as a witness,' he said. "'A witness? Of what? Of my signature, and of the date. The date is the most important. Why, Peterson, my life might hang upon it. My dear Smith, you are talking wildly. Let me beg you to go to bed. On the contrary, I never spoke so deliberately in my life. And I will promise to go to bed the moment you have signed it. But what is it? It is a statement of all that I have been telling you tonight. I wish you to witness it. Certainly, said Peterson, signing his name under that of his companion. There you are. But what is the idea? You will kindly retain it and produce it in case I am arrested. Arrested? For what? For murder. It is quite on the cards. I wish to be ready for every event. There is only one course open to me and I am determined to take it. For heaven's sake, don't do anything rash. Believe me, it would be far more rash to adopt any other course. I hope that we don't need to bother you. 
but it will ease my mind to know that you have this statement of my motives, and now I am ready to take your advice and to go to roost, for I want to be at my best in the morning. Abercrombie Smith was not an entirely pleasant man to have as an enemy. Slow and easy-tempered, he was formidable when driven to action. He brought to every purpose in life the same deliberate resoluteness which had distinguished him as a scientific student. He had laid his studies aside for a day, but he intended that the day should not be wasted. Not a word did he say to his host as to his plans, but by nine o'clock he was well on his way to Oxford. In the high street he stopped at Clifford's, the gunmaker's, and bought a heavy revolver with a box of central fire cartridges. Six of them he slipped into the chambers and, half-cocking the weapon, placed it into the pocket of his coat. He then made his way to Hasty's rooms, where the big oarsman was lounging over his breakfast, with the Sporting Times propped up against the coffee pot. Hello, what's up? he asked. Have some coffee? No, thank you. I want you to come with me, Hasty, and do what I ask you. Certainly, my boy, and bring a heavy stick with you. Hello, Hasty stared. Here's a hunting crop that would fell an ox. One other thing. You have a box of amputating knives. Give me the longest of them. There you are. You seem to be fairly on the war trail. Anything else? No, that will do. Smith placed the knife inside his coat and led the way to the quadrangle. We are neither of us chickens, Hasty, said he. I think I can do this job alone, but I take you as a precaution. I'm going to have a little talk with Bellingham. If I have only him to deal with, I won't, of course, need you. If I shout, however, up you come, and lamb out with your whip as hard as you can lick. Do you understand? All right. I'll come if I hear you bellow. Stay here, then. I may be a little time. But don't budge until I come down. I'm a fixture. Smith ascended the stairs, opened Bellingham's doors, and stepped in. Bellingham was seated behind his table, writing. Beside him, among his litter of strange possessions, towered the mummy case, with its sale number 249 still stuck upon its front, and its hideous occupant stiff and stark within it. Smith looked very deliberately round him, closed the door, and then, stepping across to the fireplace, struck a match and set the fire alight. Bellingham sat staring, with amazement and rage upon his bloated face. "'Well, really now, you make yourself at home,' he gasped. Smith sat himself deliberately down, placing his watch upon the table, drew out his pistol, cocked it, and laid it in his lap. Then he took the long amputating knife from his bosom and threw it down in front of Bellingham. "'Now then,' said he, "'just get to work and cut up that mummy.' "'Oh, is that it?' said Bellingham with a sneer. "'Yes, that is it. "'They tell me that the law can't touch you, "'but I have a law that will set matters straight. "'If in five minutes you have not set to work, "'I swear by the God who made me "'that I will put a bullet through your brain. "'You would murder me.' "'Bellingham had half risen, "'and his face was the colour of putty. "'Yes. "'And for what? "'To stop your mischief. "'One minute has gone.' But what have I done? I know, and you know. This is mere bullying. Two minutes are gone. But you must give reasons. You are a madman, a dangerous madman. Why should I destroy my own property? It is a valuable mummy. You must cut it up, and you must burn it. I will do no such thing. Four minutes are gone. Smith took up the pistol, and he looked towards Bellingham with an inexorable face. As the second hand stole round, he raised his hand, and the finger twitched upon the trigger. "'There! There! I'll do it!' screamed Bellingham. In frantic haste he caught up the knife and hacked at the figure of the mummy. Ever glancing round to see the eye and the weapon of his terrible visitor bent upon him, the creature crackled and snapped under every stab of the keen blade. A thick, yellow dust rose up from it, Spices and dried essences rained down upon the floor. 
Suddenly, with a rending crack, its backbone snapped asunder, and it fell, a brown heap of sprawling limbs upon the floor. Now into the fire, said Smith. The flames leapt and roared as the dried and tinder-like debris was piled upon it. The little room was like the stoke-hole of a steamer, and the sweat ran down the faces of the two men. But still the one stooped and worked, while the other sat watching him with a set face. A thick fat smoke oozed out from the fire, and a heavy smell of burned resin and singed hair filled the air. In a quarter of an hour, a few charred and brittle sticks were all that was left of lot number 249. Perhaps that will satisfy you, snarled Bellingham with hate and fear in his little grey eyes as he glanced back at his tormentor. No, I must make a clean sweep of all your materials. We must have no more devil's tricks. In with all these leaves. They may have something to do with it. And what now? asked Bellingham when the leaves also had been added to the blaze. Now the roll of papyrus which you had on the table that night. It is in that drawer, I think. No, no, shouted Bellingham. Don't burn that. Why, man, you don't know what you do. It is unique. It contains wisdom which is nowhere else to be found. Out with it. But look here, Smith, you can't really mean it. I'll share the knowledge with you. I'll teach you all that is in it. Or stay, let me only copy it before you burn it. Smith stepped forward and turned the key in the drawer. Taking out the yellow curled roll of paper, he threw it into the fire and pressed it down with his heel. Bellingham screamed and grabbed at it, but Smith pushed him back and stood over it until it was reduced to a formless grey ash. "'Now, Master B,' said he, "'I think I have pretty well drawn your teeth. You'll hear from me again if you return to your old tricks. And now good morning.' for I must go back to my studies. And such is the narrative of Abercrombie Smith as to the singular events which occurred in Old College, Oxford, in the spring of 84. As Bellingham left the university immediately afterwards and was last heard of in the Sudan, there is no one who can contradict his statement. But the wisdom of men is small and the ways of nature are strange. And who shall put a bound to the dark things which may be found by those who seek for them? That is the end of Lot Number 249 by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Read by Greg Wagland for Magpie Audio December 2019